As we continue our series on Isaiah, today we're going to dive into one of those topics that isn't really addressed very much in the church. It's kind of just one of those slap you on the wrist and say, no, no, don't do that. And never really given a lot of details to. Now, this is fine because it is a no, no, don't do that kind of situation. Um, but a lot of times in the church, like we want reasons. Like we, we don't want to be left in the dark as to why it's bad. We need the space to process why it's bad. And so when others are messing around with things that are bad, we can say, hang on, you need a a clear understanding of why this is wrong. This is not just a topic that's in the Bible a lot, actually, both Old Testament and New, but it's, it's a topic that is still going on today. A lot of people think of it as other cultures, but it's actually in American culture too. And it's, it's rising in my opinion as to its popularity. So let's go ahead and read the passage from Isaiah, and then we'll get a little deeper into the topic that we're into. Leaving you in suspense. What are we going to talk about? Here's a passage. Isaiah 8, 16 to 22. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Now, just to pause right there, when he says, my children are signs, it's because he's named his children after prophetic words God has given him. God's told him to give his children certain names that are prophetic words. So he's telling them, guys, remember what I named my children? They're signs to you. God has given me children as signs to you as to what he's going to do. So that's what he means when he says that. And he then goes on. And when they say to you, Inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. So just to pause right there, it's kind of a different inflection. So he tells them like, you know, rather than go to people talking with the dead, shouldn't we go and talk with God instead and then like pauses and kind of like victorious just like to the teaching and to the testimony in other words these are the things that we should pay attention to if they will not speak according to this word is because they have no dawn they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry and when they are hungry They will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. They will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. They will be thrust into thick darkness. The theme that we're going to zoom in on today is that of like magic, divination, uh, talking with the dead, necromancy, all that stuff, which to us is all no, 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 right? Just slaps on the wrist. We don't do that. Good Christians don't do this stuff. Why not? Just don't do it. You know, it's kind of that childish explanation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. So you understand why we don't do that and and kind of see some applications as to how it's still going on today. So what might be helpful is just remembering what all is associated with the realm of magic and the realm of the dead and, and, and things like that. So from a biblical standpoint, there's plenty of pictures painted as to what belongs in the realm of the dead. And none of it is good, okay? You have God, who is God of the living, Jesus tells us. So there's God who's associated with the living, not both just like those who are alive right now, but also those who have died and gone to be with him. They're not really like dead dead. They're they're with him still living. And then you have Satan, who is more or less reigning over the dead from a biblical perspective. He's associated with uh, uh, the realm of the dead. uh, The Bible tells us that Satan tried to usurp God's throne, take it from him, and as punishment, he was taken from the highest place, trying to usurp the throne at the highest heights. As judgment, he's thrown down to the lowest place. That's not just the earth, our planet, but actually underneath the earth, the realm of Sheol, which in the Bible 
In the Old Testament, it's called Sheol. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. Call it what you want. This place is the realm of the dead. This isn't hell. Hell is later. That's where things go to be done away with. But Hades slash Sheol is where the dead go. If they don't belong with the God of the living, then they belong with the little G God of the dead, with Satan. The God of this world is what Paul will call him. The little G God of this world. Okay. So already we have a bad picture of what belongs with the dead. Not only is it Satan, but it's his army of angels that tried to go to war with God. Revelation paints a picture where Satan took uh, a bunch of the angels with him. And for their punishment, they're all cast into the realm of the dead. So, not only is Satan there, but you have other fallen angels who have turned against God there. You also have those who die there. So the spirits of the dead who don't go to be with God then are associated with the realm of the dead. And then you have uh, you have the disembodied souls of the giants. We've talked about this before at 1208, but essentially um, the giants were like a, a human spiritual being hybrid that came about in Genesis 6, the Nephilim, essentially. Um, they go on to have other names, not just Nephilim, but Anakim, Rephaim. Uh, as they grow in clans, they take on different names. Well, the Bible says that the Rephaim are in the realm of the dead. So, in other words, you see that, yes, the disembodied souls of the giants from Genesis 6 are yet another kind of being associated with the realm of the dead. Now, everything that we just talked about has negative connotations. They are not God. They are not the God of the living. They are all associated with fallen beings and magic and divination and necromancy and all these kinds of things. They require access to spirits that are not working for God. Actually, in throughout the Bible, if you mess around with magic and necromancy and things like that, that's essentially considered um, adultery. It's likened to adultery, and that sounds weird to us. But if we are truly following God, and if we are being God's people, then he requires us to enter into this covenant contract with him. It's like a marriage, right? And we see that Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus is the husband, and the church is the bride. In the Old Testament, God is like the husband, and Israel is like the wife. There's other analogies that the Bible uses for this relationship as well, but essentially to pursue witchcraft in the Bible or necromancy or anything like that is to cheat on God. It's to choose to leave him for other lesser spiritual beings. And that's why it often in the Old Testament would come with the punishment of death. Because essentially, if you were an Israelite, and therefore a part of God's people, if you decided that you were going to pursue necromancy, witchcraft, magic, divination, all that, then you had essentially decided that you were going to follow false gods. You're going to follow something other than God. And therefore, you didn't have a place among God's people. You had left him, and therefore the punishment was that you would no longer be among God's people. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus says that uh, all things are forgivable, and that would include this kind of sin uh, with all this magical type stuff, right? And that actually is a, a deal in the New Testament. You have Simon the sorcerer who gets saved, but still wants to pursue magic and treats the Holy Spirit like it's this magical spirit that he can buy if he has enough money. And he gets rebuked big time for that. Uh, the disciples are like, you need to repent of this now or you're headed straight, you know, to to a huge punishment and judgment from God. So you see, like in the New Testament, like they they try to um, Simon's mind is filled with magic, and he has to renew it and break free of that life. Also in Acts, they burn a bunch of magical incantation texts because this is not 
allowed to be a part of their spiritual life with Jesus, with God. They need to leave their false gods behind, burn all those texts. They need to leave their false gods behind, not treat the Holy Spirit like he's some kind of magic and things like that, which sometimes I feel like the church still acts today like you can buy him or just send in this amount of money as a donation and we'll pray over a handkerchief and send it to you. Like that to me feels like a Christianese version of magic. Like that, that to me is borderlining, if not actually blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So in the old Testament, there are plenty of laws that if you committed them, they had a ultimate offense of they were unforgivable and uh, therefore they would they would, they might kill you over breaking those laws. But in the New Testament, Jesus says, look, everything is forgivable. Okay. I'll, I'll forgive whatever. The only thing that he holds up to like a sin of death, as we talked about last week is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which shows us kind of in our minds, like if you're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you probably don't know who God is. And you, therefore, are going to be deserving of a sin that leads to death instead of eternal life. Anyways, we look at all, all of these things and we realize that the Bible treats magic like it is a serious offense. Trying to live with the realm of the dead, with those who were humans and died, with those who were giants and died, with, with angels that have turned against God, with Satan himself. If you try to commune with that stuff, that's not just like a, oh, oh, messing around with your imagination, a little hocus pocus, uh, oh, look at them and all their, their thinking and, and just the creative imaginative picture they've painted. The Bible does not treat magic like that. It actually treats it like this is a very, grievous sin. Actually, very rarely does the Bible ever treat magic like it's fraudulent, occasionally, but it actually treats it like it is a very serious offense to pursuing these um, ways of communing with the spirit world. Christians are allotted one spirit to commune with. And that's the Holy Spirit. All other forms of any kind of spirit are off limit to us. They are all under the blanket term demons. And we alone can only give our lives over to the Holy Spirit. So that becomes a big deal for the Christian. And I hope we can see now why it would be considered sinful and wrong to pursue a relationship with some other kind of spirit. And that is not, um, like uh, to a lot of people these days, that sounds crazy, but that's what new age is. Uh, If you talk to a lot of new age people, they think that they're doing good. They think that they're pursuing some spirit that has their back and is on their side. But this is what necromancy, magic, divination, all that stuff. That's that's what it is. You've chosen one of those spirits that belongs in the realm of the dead. Instead of God himself, you've chosen something else, and you're following that. Your um, guide, your spirit guide, if you will. Uh, some kind of, of false being is your source of information. And out of that will come plenty of lies and deceit, mixed together probably with some little truths here and there that get twisted into evil and and all of that just spirals out of control until you're caught into all these traps of what the false beings in existence have for you and the bible doesn't want that for us the bible wants us to know the freedom and the truth that the holy spirit brings us that jesus brings us that god brings us and he wants us to, to find all of the freedom that comes there and not be bogged down by all of the magic and sorcery that, that is out there. It's to God we turn. All of this other stuff isn't not real. It's just not right. And so we pursue God. Now, Sometimes churches get 
confused in all of this or or they they end up doing some really weird stuff that actually borderlines on magic slash divination. We've already kind of talked about it. Pay us some money for a prayed over handkerchief, right? That's one way. But uh, I've heard stories too uh, of churches, like there was one church that started casting out demons and they're like, wow, this is real. Just like it happened in the Bible, we too can cast out demons. But then something weird happened among this church. While they would be casting out demons... After they realized that they had the ability to do this, they would start questioning the demons. Like, tell us more about the spiritual realm and the way that the world works. We, we, we command you in the name of Jesus to do this. And then they start changing all their doctrines based off what demons are telling them. <laughs> Guys, this is straight up necromancy. You know, like this, this is not... <laughs> This is not following the Holy Spirit. You are literally turning demons into the source of your knowledge and and the source of spiritual truth and realities, so-called spiritual truth and realities. And even if they were to tell you something that was true that you didn't know as a human, that's off limits from what God wants you to know. Otherwise, he would have told you. So you, you see how like the church, if they're not careful, even they can try to um, follow God, but then start intermingling with magic and sorcery, all that, and start leaving the faith without even recognizing it. Because Satan is that tricky. He has ways of hooking us without us even noticing. This church is using necromancy in order to create what they believe. And clearly that is not a church that is a place that Satan now dwells and leads the ideologies and, and all that. So you can see, you can see how people can get messed up from this, uh, not just in the past, but even today. And if you were to go to other countries, yes, you would come across witch doctors and all that kind of stuff. And, and this, what this kind of conversation wouldn't even be questionable to you. Oh, of course we know about all that stuff. Yes, of course we know about demons. Yeah. The local witch doctor who lives in town and did this and this and this. We are all familiar with that in America. We don't see a lot of that. That's not our culture. Instead, we see, uh, all of the spirits belonging to all this conversation tricking us in other ways. For example, a lot of cults get started by different kinds of forms of necromancy. If you're ever wondering, like, man, how do they get so much momentum and how do they actually get believers and people to follow them? Like all this ridiculous Scientology kind of stuff. Like how, how on earth would anybody ever fall for this? Well, it's because it finds its roots in the occult. It finds its roots in, in demonic places and, and other kind of necromantic type spiritual stuff. So when we look at all of that, we see that America actually gets prone to that. This is this weird thing that happens, okay? We in America, or just in the West in general, are very scientifically minded. And because uh, demons know that, they tend to try to tell their spiritual stories in scientific ways. So one of the weird things that's happened that you'll see if you study um, cults related to aliens <laughs> is that there is very much occultic type stuff happening in these, but they're saying not that they're demons or spirits or or spirit guides or anything like that, like New Age might say. Instead, they're saying, oh, we're aliens, we're from other planets, and we're giving you the truths beyond. So I'm going to read a little bit uh, here to kind of just give you a few examples. It's from my book, Alien Theology, where at the end I, I kind of dive into this subject. It's just to kind of help you see, like, if you were a demon in the year 2000, how would you try to communicate the things that belong with witchcraft in ways that people today would be willing to bite. So here's an example. Um, as Walter Martin points out in his book, The Kingdom of the Occult, from a Christian standpoint, those who communicate with UFOs and extraterrestrial beings have always delivered messages contrary to the Bible. This can be attributed in a large part to the occult methods that they employ when they receive their messages. 
Christians may not have ready answers to every question about UFO sightings, but in the face of extraterrestrial doctrine, no question remains as to the source of the messages. Spiritual beings opposed to God's truth and thus demonic in nature. It doesn't take long to prove Martin's point. Just take a look at some of the UFO religions out there. The founder of Swedenborgianism used the occult means of astral projection to gain insight from supposed spirit beings on other planets. Astral projection is a form of, of magic. And so this scientific UFO religion based on the starts of magic. The founder of Theosophy used occult spirit channeling where the aliens possessed them in order to use the voice, use their voice to communicate and their hands to write with. So just as we might see like a possession when we're doing a, deliver, a demonic deliverance in church today, believe it or not, that's exactly what that religion was looking at. Why, why would a spiritual, why, sorry, why would a physical alien need to spiritually possess someone to do this stuff? You, you see where this all gets together. The Urantia Foundation used trance channeling in which aliens dictated a message to a psychiatric doctor through a patient of his. The Figu Society and the International Raelian Movement both used telepathy to communicate with aliens. The Unarius Academy of Science received telepathic and psychic communications from aliens, and they teach on things like reincarnation and clairvoyance. The Aetherius Society, which believed that UFOs would bring the Earth into the New Age, used occult channeling and taught clairvoyance, and even taught that Jesus moved to Venus after his resurrection. The Christian that is awake to the supernatural recognizes the origins of all of these false UFO religions. These cult leaders are the servants of demons, and they're being played. Their messages are born out of occult techniques, and their teachings are riddled with demonic lessons. In their deception, these tricky little demons know how to relate to the people of our time. They don't need to convince people that they're spiritual beings to mislead them, but rather they can use the facade of aliens, because the 21st century mind will bite at a spiritual message like that. And unfortunately, their elaborate schemes work on many. If you're paying attention, you can't miss these demonic themes. While stating his own research in an interview, Heiser points out that it's about messaging. What people are told when they supposedly come in contact with an alien, and things that are done to them, that kind of thing. It's not a coincidence in my mind, and again, this isn't unique to me, but when you take the contactee messaging and you actually look at what being said, it is honestly very anti-Christian. It's very anti-biblical worldview. So that just raises some questions immediately. Why would an extraterrestrial feel the need to undermine this particular faith, Christianity, and not any of the other ones? And then when you look at the abduction rituals, I think we can almost call them that, and compare that like to satanic ritual abuse procedures, it's really kind of startling. And when you actually get into abduction literature and you notice that a lot of the content, again, mirrors like medieval accounts of demonization, that is highly suggestive that we have something sinister going on. In this interview, Heiser references a list from the 1992 MIT conference on alien abduction in which Jacques Vallée and John Keel made comparisons between alien abduction accounts and satanic ritual abuse survivor accounts. The similarities are disturbing. To name a few, both accounts have perpetrators that are reptilian creatures, men in black, or shadows in the mind. The messages communicated from both aliens and ritual abusers are, we will return, and do not tell. The aliens also tell their abductees uh, to breed, while ritual abuse survivors are forced to breed. In both accounts, there's amnesia, bonding, memory loss, drugging, the feeling of being trapped, paranormal experiences, ESP, out-of-body, astral travel, terror, fear, anxiety, paranoia, deep painless wounds, headaches, sleep difficulties, visual disturbances, sexual disturbances, nightmares, depression, humiliation, obsessive thoughts, PTSD, fear of hypnosis, and even suicidal feelings. There is also pain. Many things are done against their free will, 
on both sides of the coin. Now, that right there is just a look at the alien cults of today. There are religions formed around what aliens have come and taught some human leaders. It's not, though. Everything that we just described is spiritual in nature, and it is exactly the definition of of how witchcraft and uh, necromancy and magic and divination, all of that stuff is exactly what makes those cults. And people today are flocking to New Age religions and to these kind of like scientific sounding spiritual religions because they're not finding in the church the reality sometimes of the spiritual world. And even if they deny it, they're still looking for it. They want to know more. And the Holy Spirit tells us, I, I'm the great counselor. I'm, I'm the great teacher. I'm the spirit of Jesus. I can teach you the real truth and the real stuff that is out there. As long as I will allow you to know. But then people learn about all this forbidden knowledge, about all this um, occultic type stuff. And they begin to mess around with demons and they have real spiritual experiences there because the church wouldn't show them the one true spirit, the Holy Spirit. They go to church, but they just kind of hear about traditions and some good teachings and moral stuff. But they, they didn't find, they didn't find the Holy Spirit. Are we showing them that? Again, let's let's return to Isaiah, right? Isaiah lived in a time where people would flock to people that would associate themselves with fallen spirits, with mediums and necromancers and all that. And that was among Israel. The people who weren't supposed to practice this stuff were practicing this stuff. You see all the more reason why God had to turn them over to exile and to judgment, right? And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. When people tell you, go talk to the mediums and necromancers with their little stupid sayings. Isaiah says, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? No, to the teaching and to the testimony to the stuff God has already taught us, to the law, to the prophets, to Jesus, we turn to that stuff because that stuff is truth. We turn to the Holy Spirit because he teaches us real truth. And when we turn to him, we find what we need. We don't need to go to all this false stuff that's forbidden to us. We don't need forbidden knowledge, whether it's true or deceit. We just need Jesus. We just need the one true God. So Isaiah has strong words to a people that are running to false stuff. They're not to do that anymore. Turn to God and God alone. So now, when you run into someone and they're like, why, why is that stuff bad? Or, or if you ever wondered yourself, why is this stuff bad? Know the answers. That stuff isn't fraudulent, it's not fake, but it's not of God and it's not for us. And so we turn away from it because to follow that is to follow another religion, to follow another God, to follow another spirit. And therefore, we've walked out of Christianity. And so if you find even now that you've done that, now's the time to repent. Leave all that behind and come back.